everyone here this morning. This uh, Valentine's Day coming up very soon, and the first video reminded me of when it showed couples holding hands when we had teenage children yet, and we were living near Hicksville, Ohio, and our neighbor girl and my oldest daughter were such close friends, and they just would talk and share things with each other, and they would share how they thought it was so cute that their parents still held hands. It speaks to children when they see their parents showing any sign of affection, and I hope that uh, this Valentine's Day is a good day for you. But above that, we hope that today is a good day. We're looking forward to the fellowship dinner uh, this afternoon after we, or this morning yet, after we finish the morning service. Today I'm going to be speaking about a challenge. It's a challenge to each one of us to legacy living. I want us to think today about what we're going to leave behind. If you talk to an attorney, they'll talk to you about maybe the possibility of legacy giving, especially if you have much wealth. Many of us don't have to worry much about that. But we give something in a will that we pass on. So today the challenge is going to be for us to think about what it is we pass on. Before I begin the day's message, let's just bow for a word of prayer. Father, today we just come before you thanking you for the opportunity to gather with brothers and sisters in Christ, to worship you, to adore you. We do that through prayers and through the music we do it through the preaching of the word, but above all, Lord, we do it through each one's individual hearts as we turn our hearts, hearts toward you. Father, today we ask that the Holy Spirit might just speak freely to each one of us, whether it needs to be in conviction or through inspiration, showing us, inspiring us of a way that we can live better lives for you. Father, today we want to lift up all the needs in the world around us as well. Father, we see so much suffering. We see what's going on over in Turkey and Syria with the earthquake. We see wars and we hear all kinds of distressing times. But yet, Lord, we know these are signs of the times that we live in. We know, Father, that also you've given us, the church, a commission to go out and reach others for Christ because the end is coming. And it appears that it may be soon to some of us. We have we think that way, and for others think it could be a long time, but whatever, Lord, you know the day and the hour, you and only you. Until you come, Father, I pray that you would help us and guide us, encourage us, and help us to pass the word on to future generations. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Every person has something that you could call your heritage. Each one of us will, in one way or another, though, leave a legacy. An author by the name of Kerry Casey, he wrote a book. Well, his first book was Championship Fathering. His second book was Championship Grandfathering, and I'm reading that because it's more appropriate for me at my age. We go through some of these terms, and you think about legacy versus heritage, his definition of heritage is combined traditions, beliefs, behaviors, and achievements and failures that your ancestors have passed on to you. You can't change your heritage. It's your history. There are people in your past, some of them you don't even know, some of them you're very familiar with perhaps, and they're actions, their lives are passed on to you, and you can't change that. There's not a thing you can do about it. But the legacy, his definition of that is what you add to your heritage. It's what you contribute to the heritage before you pass it on to the children or grandchildren, or maybe it's even to strangers or neighbor kids or someone in your neighborhood. You can pass on a legacy. You don't have to be a parent or a grandparent. You can be a single person and have a tremendous legacy that you can pass on to others or to your community. While this man was, uh, was writing to grandfathers like me, my message today is just as much for mothers and grandfathers and parents and single people. Single people, maybe even to young children, because you can start working on your legacy even now as a young person. Many years ago, there's a story, and some of you may have heard this before. It's one of my favorite stories. It shows how important it is, how we live. It was a man lived in, I believe, the 17th century. His name was Max Jukes. 
and the Jukes family tree was investigated, and they found 1,200 descendants of this Max Jukes, who himself was a criminal and a scoundrel. Of his 1,200 descendants, 400 of them physically wrecked their lives by drunkenness and bad living. They found that there was 310 of them that were professional beggars and con men. 130 of them were convicted criminals. 60 of them were habitual thieves. Seven of them became murderers. And out of the 1,200, only 20 of them ever learned a trade. And half of those learned it while they were in prison. That's quite a legacy, quite a heritage, a history that's passed on. Another man, though, from the 17th century, the greatest preacher he was called in the uh, American history and with the awakening, he's associated with a man named Jonathan Edwards. He was raised in a preacher's home himself, but they also investigated some of his descendants and they found 400 of his descendants, 14 of which became college presidents, 100 became pres- professors, 100 became ministers or missionaries, and over a hundred of them became lawyers or judges, 60 doctors. Also, there were authors and editors of magazines and newspapers, and by the end of that century, they said every major industry in America had someone that was in connection to that line from the Edwards family, all from one man's lineage, who he himself was raised in a godly home. How could this happen? Generations living the patterns of their ancestors, either good or bad. And I want to tell you right now, if you're listening and you think, oh no, I'm doomed because I don't have that great of a heritage, it can change. It can change at any generation with any person. It can change either for good or bad, though. Are these behaviors and destinies, are they locked in? Jesus taught his disciples, from the parable of the sower, which is where I'm preaching from today. It's a very familiar passage, and I'm going to put my focus on a little bit different portion of this, but we're still going to look at the entire parable. And it comes from Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 8. That's where, well, it's the whole chapter 8, but I'm going to read verses 4 through 8. So Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 4. While there was a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up, and it choked out the plants. Still, there was other seed that fell on good soil. It came up and it yielded a crop a hundred times more than what was sown. When he said this, he called out, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Four different conditions are encountered here in this parable of the soil. That last comment, ears to hear, let them hear, it indicates that you have a desire to hear. It also indicates that you have an ability to understand. One of the shocking things that Jesus is going to tell us in a moment is that not everybody has the ability to understand. And he gives reasons for that. The disciples actually ask this question to him in the next couple of verses. Verse 9 and 10 His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to others, I speak in parables so that, now get this, though seeing, they may not see. Though hearing, they may not understand. Well, how cruel is that? Why in the world would the God of the universe and then his son come and tell stories to people and not have them understand? It seems like that's not fair, correct? If you understand the parable, hopefully we will by the end. Many of you have heard this before. But the parables of Jesus, they reveal the truth in the form of an illustration. And for some, while these parables conceals it from others, others would understand it. If you understand it, then it talks 
later, he'll explain why it is. He says, why would God do that, by the way, and why is it that he quotes this verse from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9? Isaiah also had to deliver a message. Isaiah was told, go and tell the people, and that, that quote Jesus just gave was from that chapter of Isaiah 6. He had to give, Isaiah had to give a message to a people who had hard and calloused hearts. Jesus, when he came on the scene, he also encountered many who had hard and calloused hearts. So Jesus, in explaining this parable, he reveals four situations or conditions that existed in Isaiah's day that still existed in Jesus' day, and I want to tell you it still exists today. So this is a very timely parable because its teaching is still present. In Luke 8, verse 11 through 15, he goes on with this explanation. Jesus said, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and he takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy, and when they hear it, but they have no root, they believe it for a while, but in the time of testing they fall away, and the seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear. But as they go on their way, they're choked by life's worries and riches and pleasures, and they do not mature, but the seed on the good soil, it stands for those with a noble and a good heart who hear the word and retain it, and by persevering, they produce a crop. So we want to stop and break this down just a little bit. And one thing that might help some of you, if, if you're listening on Facebook to this and you've never heard this parable before, maybe you don't read your Bible and have never heard a story like this. Jesus is explaining something to the people to make it show the condition of something they were familiar with, farming. Back in that day, everyone farmed. They raised some of their own crop. They raised some garden. They tried to produce their own food. Also in that region of Israel, they had certain types of soil. Now, for some of you, if you've never planted, and we see the farmers today, they go out with drills and planters, and they cut through. They've got knives, and they cut through the ground. It's very modern. Back then, and with this parable in mind, it was more like, for some of you, maybe you can think of it like you go out to fertilize your lawn in the spring, and you get either a drop spreader or a broadcast spreader, don't you? This is like a broadcast spreader. You know, the one you crank or the one you push and the little wheel goes around and it throws the seed. We throw fertilizer, but you could use it to throw grass seed or to throw grain, top dressing on a field. And the grain was just left there. Some of it would take hold, some wouldn't. So he's telling, like, as a farmer back in that day would scatter the seed many times by hand or sometimes they'd have a cloth that they would use to help scatter it, it would fall in certain kinds of conditions. Now, you know that if you get seed and you drop it on a sidewalk, well, some of the ground where they trampled and the pathways becomes rock hard, and the seed cannot penetrate it. It lays on top, and oftentimes the birds come and they just eat the seed, the hard, packed-down ground. That's the seed here that can't be penetrated. It's so hard that the seed is just snatched away, and that's the way some people's hearts are. All of these types of soil are really speaking about the different types of hearts. Isaiah encountered people with those heart conditions. Jesus did, and we still can find those people today. You and I know people that probably fit in every one of these categories. The path that was hard, it didn't stand a chance. It never even began, and that would be like the people who you try to share the gospel with, and they have no interest whatsoever there is no chance in the condition they're in of them receiving the word and it growing because they are so hardened. Now, that can change, but it takes some real work to make that change. But then he goes on with the next type of ground. I'm going to call these later. We'll refer to them as types one, two, and three, and four, four types. The rocky ground, the second type, that sounds good kind of to person they're saying this is a person who says that that gospel message it sounds good i think i'll give it a try i want to sample this i want to try out this christianity i want to see what it's all about but they try it for a little time and it, they're bored with it or it just doesn't seem to sink in that doesn't really get any growth 
because the soil is so poor. It's rocky. It's, it's kind of hard, too. It's a little bit poorly conditioned, you might say. So they have no growth. They never really get the faith. And that just doesn't take root. Some of them you could compare to people who live in such an environment where people scoff, make fun of, reject the word, and it's hard for them among that type of an environment. Maybe it's in your family for you to get saved because of the background. I want to tell you that that can change, by the way. I'm going to tell you a, a story of a man here. It kind of goes along with like the Max Jukes or the Jonathan Edwards. There's a man I know. He passed away. I went to his uh, funeral a few years ago. He went to our church, and I heard his, first time I ever met him, I heard his testimony. He came to our church to speak. He grew up in a family of migrant workers, and they moved from the south, and they'd come up through this, <clears throat> this area, and they would harvest the crop. They were, he was living in a barn, but someone took him to church. He got saved, and once he got saved, I think he was only 10 or 12 years old, he had like 10 siblings and parents. Eventually, over the next few years, this young boy led his family to the Lord. The entire family got saved. So I'm talking to some young people out here today, too. If you think this legacy stuff is just something grandparents talk about with their attorneys, or you think that's something old parents think about, no, you start building your legacy now. If you're a believer, your legacy, you start building it. He got his family saved, and he was just a young boy. He had an impact. He came from a situation where the ground was kind of rocky, but he succeeded. Then there's others here, this ground that's among the thorns. This is a person perhaps who desires. They really sounds good at first when they hear the message of God's word. They want to participate. They want to enjoy serving the Lord or worshiping. They enjoy also, though, the pleasures of the world and the friends, they can't leave the friends, and the friends maybe can't accept them the way they are, so they keep tugging them back into the old world. See, they're back among the thorns. They're being drawn back to their old ways, being drug away to old activities, and they just cannot quite grow up and mature. They start to develop, and they stop. And then there's no harvest in the future because it's cut off at that point. The fourth type of soil was the good soil. This is even refers to in the scriptures those who have a good and have a noble heart. These are the ones with a true desire to hear God's word and actually to be transformed by it. So back to the question that the disciples asked as to why did Jesus speak in parables. We know that the parables, they make a message more clear. They make it easier to understand. It's an illustration. It's a word picture. It makes something that's more memorable that you can also take with you and helps the listener to associate the story with that word picture and to get its point or to drive the point home. Those who had a heart or a desire to understand, they're never turned away. If you really desire to know what the Word has to say, you're not turned away. God receives you, and He will help you to learn. But we can imagine in the vast crowds that were coming to see Jesus at this time, so they were coming from all the towns around, along with the sincere searchers and the seekers that were there, there also came some who were just curious and insincere, and that always happens. And some of them are users. They're the people that come along with a crowd because maybe there's benefit. I wonder if they're going to feed them today. You know, I heard he passed out some bread and fish at another time. You know, maybe they were looking for just some entertainment there was nothing good on the Super Bowl was last week. You know, there's nothing good to watch on the tube tonight. So they just wanted some entertainment. And then there's some that were skeptics. Or there's some that like to see the show, the healings perhaps, or entertained by the show. And then the skeptics who would heckle and disrupt and taunt or maybe challenge the teachings of Jesus. These people we know is certainly the category of the Pharisees fell into that group. For men and women such as all of these, not all of these, but the ones that heckled and the Pharisee type, the gospel was hidden by the condition of their hard heart. 
they had no real desire to know what Jesus was talking about. There are those people who attend church sometimes, and they just want it for the social aspects. I, in our church years ago, it was a large church, probably 500 people, and there was a man there, and he came, and all he came for, and he came for just two or three weeks, he came to glad hand people. You'd have thought he was a politician, but what he was was a businessman, and he was out handing out his business cards to everybody in the vestibule or the foyer or whatever you want to call the entrance to your church, and he was just trying to drum up business. Not everybody that comes to hear the word is really there to hear the word. Some people have the wrong type of soil in their heart. They're not going to get much out of that. For those who could not or would not understand Jesus' teachings, it was actually a form of divine judgment that they couldn't understand it. That's according to a theologian, by the way. Some of you know R.C. Sproul. He said that. He said that the parables, actually the fact that people couldn't understand the teaching of Jesus, it was actually a form of divine judgment. That's how Jesus hid it. If they had a heart that desired, they could hear it. But if they had a hard heart, it was soon going to be revealed. In Isaiah's day, God spoke to Israel through the prophet those words. He said, be ever hearing, but never understanding be ever seeing, but never perceiving. They could hear it, but they couldn't understand. They could see, but they don't get the meaning of it. In the parable of the sower, it is the condition of the heart that equals the type of soil. So what you have to ask yourself is, which one of those soil types do I have? What's my heart like? Does my heart receive this seed, the Word of God, and Jesus? Because Jesus, you know, is called the Word of God. Jesus is the Word. So if you don't receive the seed, the parable, you don't receive the Word, you're rejecting Jesus if you won't receive Him. He's called the Word in John 1.1 1, 1 and John 1.14 as well as some other locations in the Scriptures. The Apostle Paul gave a warning to a young pastor named Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 verses 6 and 7. He was talking in that passage to this young pastor about people who are loaded down with sins, and they're swayed by all kinds of evil desires. They're always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That tells me that Paul's warning this young pastor, some of these people are going to be in your church. Some of these people are going to listen to your messages. Some of these people may always be learning. They want to learn with a head knowledge, but they're never able to come to the knowledge of truth because their heart is hard. Just because you have a great deal of scholarship and Bible knowledge does not mean that you've ever received Jesus into your heart. I've known pastors who've told me, or I've read about, that they have become saved or born again sometimes years after they were in the pulpit. Back in colonial days, I, I didn't look this up, but I remember reading about one pastor. He preached very stoically in the pulpit and he had done this for years in such a formal church. He had a Holy Ghost experience one time. It transformed him and changed him. He came to church, and he started preaching, and the pulpit seemed alive, and it seemed different when he preached the Word. And partway through his sermon, someone out there jumped up and said, Hallelujah, the preacher got saved. <laughs> Can you imagine sitting underneath a man who wasn't saved? Well, if he preaches the Word of God, the Word of God still has great effect, even if a non-believer were to proclaim it. Because we're promised the Word of God does not go out and return void. But how much more power and how much greater when the pulpit is filled with a man who's got the Holy Spirit in him and who's been saved? Isn't God wonderful? He can use everybody. He can especially use you if you're willing to be used by him. Why can't these people that Jesus is talking to, why can't they believe? It's because no matter how much they read and they study, no matter how much people attend church or listen to teachings and preachings, their heart is hard, like the path that was hardened, type one soil, so hard. The word can't take root in the rocky ground, or the word is cloaked out by their choked out by their 
cherished sins. That's the word among thorns. That's types two and three of the soil. That's their heart's condition. The first steps to having the heart that is represented by the good soil, it always must begin with confession. Confession of your sins. Confession of any evil desires. It's like the infomercial, though. Wait, but wait, there's more. There's more than just confessing those sins and those evil desires. Here's the next part of it. Confession, if it's not noble and honest, you're not going to have any repentance. If it is noble and honest, there's going to be repentance. That's the more. It's not enough just to confess that you're a sinner. It's not enough just to say, yes, I do this. What's really important is that you repent, which means you turn away from, you change, you stop doing that behavior. The first steps to having the heart that is represented by the good soil has confession followed by repentance. Hosea chapter 10 verse 12 talks about something that can help with this problem. If you think you have either type 1, 2, or 3 type of soil in your heart, there is a remedy for that. Or if you confess and you just think, I haven't repented, I haven't gotten victory over the sin. There's something that can happen for that. In Hosea chapter 10, verse 12, Hosea writes this. Hosea says, sow righteousness for yourselves. Reap the fruit of unfailing love. Sounds like a good thing for Valentine's Day. Let's reap the fruit of unfailing Well, No. Hosea is going on here and he says, here's the instruction. And break up your unplowed ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers his righteousness on you. There's other scriptures also. I think Jeremiah talks about breaking up the unplowed ground. That's the path. That's the ground that has the rocks in the soil. That's the one that has the thorns. Sometimes a person's heart is hardened. Sometimes it's a bad situation and you need to break up the ground. Gets at least one farmer in here I know that understands what a chisel plow is. A chisel plow is a great instrument. It's like this deep knife, and you go in really deep and break up ground. Sometimes a chisel plow goes over, and when I first saw that tool many years ago, I was kind of wondering what it was really doing because it didn't change the surface so much. It went deep. It went deep, and it breaks up the underneath side, and it helps to get the moisture. It gets nutrients going through. It helps to stir the ground deeper. If you are having trouble understanding God's word, if you're having trouble moving forward in your Christian life, maybe you prayed the prayer every week at the end of my sermons, almost every week, I've prayed the sinner's prayer telling you how to get saved. And if you're listening on Facebook today, I want to tell you that it's, there's more that God has for you. And it goes beyond just praying the sinner's prayer. If you will repent of your sins and say, Lord, I'm ready Bring the chisel plow in and break up that hard pan. Break up that hard ground so I might live for you and I might produce a harvest. It is those who've confessed and repented that receive the word of God. They receive the blessing of it and when you receive it, it allows you to produce a harvest. Remember, Jesus is the synonymous word for the word. Jesus is the word. Such sincerity of the honest heart that he talks about here, it is what renders, it's sincere hearts that renders the capability to receive the word, the seed that's talked about here in this parable. Many adults that I've talked to, in fact, we had a relative who said this. She had grown up going to church her whole life. She was an adult. She had gone since a little girl. But she said until, I think she was in her early 30s when she got saved. Huh, went to church her whole life and wasn't saved. But when she got saved, she said suddenly the word of God spoke to her. She opened it up. She says, it's amazing. I read the same stories I've heard all my life and those didn't sink in. And suddenly they mean something to me. I'm changed. I can understand that's a Holy Spirit function, by the way. 
but it also caused her to have a desire, and it's worked that way for many others, to have a desire for more, more reading, more teaching, more preaching. So one of the symptoms that you really are saved is you have a desire for God's Word, that you have a desire for the things of God. If you've truly invited Him in and you have Jesus in your heart, then your desires will change toward God. Now I'd like to bring your attention again to this last verse of this parable that Jesus taught. Verse 15 of chapter 8. I want to talk about this once more. But the seed that fell on the good soil, it stands for those with the noble and the good heart. Those who hear the word, those who retain it, and by persevering, they produce a crop. And this brings me to the main point of there are many main points can be brought out from this. I hope I've taught you some things from this or reminded you at least. But the main point I want to focus on in involving the legacy living involves this verse. Because this verse is very real and practical implication of an expectation that God has for those who've heard the word and profess to be a Christian. And it is this, that the believer's those who are born again are expected to produce a crop. We are expected, if we're good soil, and you think you're a Christian, we should be producing something. Produce a crop. What does that mean? Well, if I plant a sunflower seed, I get sunflowers. If I plant a soybean, I get soybeans. If I plant a kernel of corn, hopefully I get a lot of corn. Right, Harold? We want an abundance. William Graham Jr., <clears throat> in his book, Redeemed. He told this story. This is a true story. In 1959, there was a bus driver named Ron. Ron was in Sydney, Australia, and Billy Graham was having a weeks-long crusade over in Australia. Well, Ron was a man who had a problem. He was an alcoholic, and his marriage has fallen apart, but his job was to be one of the many bus drivers that were going to be busing people to the place where the crusade was taking place. There was over a million people that attended that week, they've estimated. So he was driving bus every night, every day, taking people there, and he was profoundly upset and irritated by the people that were going to this crusade because he wasn't a believer, and they seemed happy. And one of the things that really bothered him is after the crusade, when they came out, they were happier yet. And they were singing and praising God so many times, and it really ticked him off. He didn't like being around these people, but he had to do it. And he didn't mind making a little verbal jabs at them. He did not hide his disdain from these people coming out of Billy Graham's crusades. But then a friend invited his wife, unbeknownst to him, to the crusade, and she went to the crusade, and she surrendered her life that evening. She went home and she began working on her husband and he had a day off scheduled and she got him to attend the crusade as well. At first, he had decided while he was sitting there listening to Billy Graham, this isn't for me. But then Billy started talking about there being a man in this audience who's listening and hearing God tug at his heart tonight and you're a broken man. Ron realized that described him. He was a broken man, an alcoholic. He was mean to his family. He had rejected Christ before, but now his broken man inside him, he heard a voice, a small, still voice that said, go. Ron got up from his seat. He went forward that night. He gave his life to Christ at the altar at that Billy Graham crusade, and his life was radically changed, radically changed, and it transformed him immediately. The couple began to mend their broken marriage. Ron would later on even be called into the ministry. Their children were then raised in a Christian home. They grew up, his children grew up married, they had children of their own, and those children, Ron's grandchildren, they chose to follow Christ as well. What could have been generations of hurts and scars became generations of light, of hope, of faith, all because a young man and his wife both said yes to Jesus. 
Ron and his wife once broken ground. That ground had to be broken. It had to be worked up a little bit to make it easier to receive the word, the seed. They opened their hearts to Jesus. They heard the word. They retained it. They received it. And then they persevered and they produced a crop. They produced three generations of believers. Now, the legacy of faith is often passed on and most easily recognizable is it's passed on in families. It's passed on by grandparents and parents. But legacy living is also producing a crop by single people. So I want you to understand this is not just for families. If I know many people who are single who have lived their lives for Christ and have helped to mentor and bring many people into the fold of Christianity. I know many people who have mentored others and helped them just to grow. There is no excuse. God wants everyone to produce a crop. If you're a believer, if you're good soil, you should be producing. Now, we all produce crops maybe in different ways. We can't all be preachers and teachers, and the Scriptures talk, that's other teaching. But legacy living involves producing a crop by perhaps a single person or an aunt or an uncle, mentors, anyone perhaps even who is able to support a ministry. And certainly as we age, the way that we can do things changes. There was a man in my life that came into my life through our church. He was in his 80s, and we were still late 20s, early 30s. We had four children under the age of 10, I know. His wife was in the nursing home, but this man was a Christian. He was a retired minister, and he wanted to get to know us better. He cooked dinner and invited us over to his home. Now, what single man in his 80s invites a family of six to his house for dinner when his wife isn't even capable. She wasn't even there. She's in the nursing home. But that man spoke truth and integrity into my life. He helped to mentor me. He was one of many people who did things in my life. So my encouragement to you is, and I know many of you are doing it, is no matter where you are in your life, be a mentor. Be someone who helps to tend that soil. That's making a legacy. Christianity is not a job that you retire from when you become a certain age. But the job description might change. It's changed radically for Pam and I over the years. So for each of us, I want you to understand that there is no retirement from this call to produce a crop. One of the ways we can do it is by supporting other, maybe it's just through giving, maybe it's through praying, maybe it's through knocking on doors, inviting people to attend church or attend Christian Bible studies. Maybe it's helping parachurch organizations like Young Life or Youth for Christ or our local LifeWise Academy or Samaritan's Purse or the Gideons or the Hands of Hope. The list goes on and on for organizations. These are things that help to build a legacy. Carrie Casey said this, your legacy has no limits, it only has potential. I want you to think about that. The legacy that you're, and every one of you is going to leave behind some legacy. Hopefully it's a good one. Your legacy has no limits, it only has potential. Every ministry that I've ever known of can benefit from your support in a variety of ways. Maybe just pray and ask God how he would like you to contribute to a certain ministry that you feel called to. Jesus also, by the way, had a support system. And his support system is found in chapter 8, the verses that I skipped. I purposely skipped them because I saved them for this point in time. At the very beginning of Luke chapter 8, before he gives the parable, it says in those first three verses, after this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, he was proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. We expect that. The disciples were there. And also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, who is called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. And then there is a woman named Joanna, the wife of Chusa. 
Chusa, her husband, was the manager of Herod's household. Now, Herod died. That's why Jesus was an infant, but his heirs take over. Others are running things, and her husband actually was part of Herod's household. Susanna and many others were there. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. That's what I wanted to get to. It's not just marriages. It's not just grandparents and parents that pass on a legacy. These were single women that are named. It could just as well have been some single men, you know, that had. But they are contributing to the ministry of Jesus, and they were important. I don't know what all they were doing. Maybe they were collecting the offering, something we haven't ever done here in this church. Maybe they were fixing the meals. Maybe they were helping pray with people. Maybe they were carrying water. I have no idea, but they were there to help. Every minister, every ministry, pardon me, every ministry has needs. Every ministry needs people to come alongside it and support it. They had a very serious and effective support team of women who were helping Jesus from time to time minister to those who needed to be ministered to. The point I'd like to say is this, service to the Lord in any manner is a sign of gratitude. If you don't do any service to the Lord of any kind, are you really grateful? Really? Did Christ save you? If he really saved you and you're glad, wouldn't you show it by doing something? It gets uncomfortable sometimes to think about, but I have to chastise myself too. God's word is that way. But he says, the good soil is going to persevere and produce a crop. What crop are you producing? Most, if not all, the women that we talked about there at the beginning, see, they were women who had been healed or set free, healed of diseases or illnesses, or they have been set free of evil spirits. They used whatever means, evidently, that they had, their abilities Maybe it was finances, but I think it was probably more just their physical abilities to serve in other ways. Jesus' ministry. And in doing this, they left a legacy for others. The obvious challenge, I think, to everyone is to examine our own hearts from this parable. Do you have a good heart? Do you have a noble and an honest heart? Are you grateful for what God has done for you? If so then I believe that God is telling you, telling us, that we need to be producing a crop. Let's pray. Father, today we thank you for the opportunity to be here together and to read your word, to study your word. Father, I just pray that you would work through the Holy Spirit to show each one of us where we can be most effective in serving you. Lord, at this time, I'd just like to pause for a moment. If there's anyone out there today, either here or on Facebook, who you've never even accepted Christ as Savior, and you feel the Holy Spirit telling you you need to take that first step, you want to confess your sins and repent, then you can do that right now. Say, Lord, here I am. I confess I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins, Lord. I open my heart's door to you, and please come in. Help me, Father to change my ways because I repent of the sins. Help me to live for you and pray that in Jesus' name. If that was your first step prayer, I assure you he will come in. For those who have been believers for just a few moments or days or maybe 50 years, Father, we just pray that you would show us. Show us the way that we can be more effective in producing a crop for you. Father, I pray that you would help us never to have our soil, our heart, become hard again. Help our hearts to stay free from rocks and weeds and things that inhibit it. Help us to avoid all those things that might draw us away from serving you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to always bring glory and honor to you and help us to produce a crop and the crop of good works and good things for the honor and glory of your kingdom and of your name. And it's in that precious name we pray, in Jesus' name, amen.